guest speaker for tonight's KDDP banquet. When you look back on his amazing career and remember how he got started, he's the perfect fit to be with us tonight to be talking to seven promising young drivers, plus all the many other aspiring racers who may be watching on Racing America. He cut his teeth in racing behind the wheel of late models on the bull rings out west, much like this year's KDDP champion has been doing this year. He enjoyed a meteoric rise to the top of the stock car ranks, going straight from the trucks up to Cup, and has now been a fixture in NASCAR's premier series for more than two decades. Plus, he's even ventured into IndyCar, sports car, and NHRA competition. One of the most competitive racers ever, his incredible Cup record boasts 34 wins, 161 top five finishes, and 339 top 10s and 776 starts including a Daytona 500. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the 2004 NASCAR Cup Series champion, Kurt Busch. And we're really glad that Kurt could be here because of any of you folks who may listen to the Howard Stern Show, you know he'll probably be going to Ronnie Limo Driver's wedding here coming up soon, so we're really looking forward to those stories. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm just blown away by the, the racing wisdom in this room and watching these panelists speak. Uh, it's, it's, it's humbling, and it's, uh, it's amazing to feel the stories from everybody, and I'll calm down here in a second. Uh, it's just it's exciting to be here because I'm an Alec Wickie fan. In 1992, I remember uh, being 14 years old. Um, you're August 9th, is that what I just learned? Yeah. Right. Okay, your math was way off. <laughs> Happy birthday, Leo. So in, in 1992, I'm 14 years old. I had never driven a competitive race. Um, my dad uh, had me glued to the TV with him, and we are watching, and like, just the compelling story of Richard Petty King in his final race, uh, Jeff Gordon starting his first race with the three Fords that I thought were the only ones eligible. I learned that Kyle was, was part of the, mathematically eligible. And with Mark Martin, well, Mark Martin was championship eligible every year. That's how good Mark was. But I knew it was a Ford year. And the way that you could see things unfold, it, you just could never predict what was going to happen. And the timing of the way, and, and I've learned so much tonight, of the way that Alan put it all together and to see him counting laps from the car to have those bonus points of most laps led. I remember my dad telling me, they're staying out so they get most laps led. And those are those small moments that always stick with you. And then when you get to listen and hear this, that's what I want the young seven drivers tonight to, to listen into. And I'll give you my story, and I won't make it too long. But to have a go-kart for Christmas at seven years old. It was a little yard cart. It wasn't a race car. It was just a yard cart. And my dad would never let me drive it unless I was watching the Sunday cup race with him, and then we would go and take it out to the bank parking lot because banks are closed on Sunday. And he would stand there and watch me drive the, the cart around, and we would smash soda cans, and he would go and make laps first, and then I would go and make laps. And within my second year, you know, I'm eight years old. Uh, I'm probably still 55 pounds then. I could go faster than my dad. I'm like, man, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I'm watching the races. I'm now feeling the race car, and I can beat him on the stopwatch. But mom never liked racing. She didn't, I mean, she supported my dad. Uh, my, my grandma was always there for, for my dad's racing. There was always a car in the garage, uh, but she's like, here's this baseball glove. Here's this baseball bat. Why don't you play in Little League Baseball? And so uh, Uncle Keith, he would always take me to baseball games, but there was always a race car in the garage. It was always cooler and easier to hang out with Dad and be by the car than it was to do my schoolwork or to go play baseball. The car spoke to me, his, his car, and I got to go to the races with him, and that was a way of life. We weren't from money. We didn't have much. 
Uh, he was an auto mechanic and a tool salesman. And I remember sneaking in the pits. He, he helped me sneak in the pits. He put me in some dude's chunk. And it's Manzanita Speedway, 1993. And uh, he was running his dwarf car down there on dirt. And I remember him talking after Friday night. It was a two-day show. It was Friday and Saturday. And he goes, man, I can't hang with those guys. Those guys are just beating us. Uh, we're just, we're just going to have to try to run consistent two nights in a row and see where we end up. And I'm like this 14-year-old kid going, Dad, you can totally beat those guys. You totally got this. Like, let's do this. And so he finished third on uh, the first night when the track was real wet and tacky. Uh, we're from Las Vegas, Nevada, where dirt tracks aren't really supposed to exist. The dirt sucks out there. <laughs> and so the second night, the track was dry slick. And he went out and dominated. And I remember that was my first time in the infield ever. And the cars were going around me. I'm like, whoa. You know, I'd been on the outside forever. And he's just like, make sure you stand here and don't go anywhere while I'm racing. I'm like, okay. So I'm just watching the car go around and he wins, and I just go running over to the scales and check on him, and he sees me, and he's just like, stand back, just get over there. Well, he's trying to pack wet mud into the kickouts so that his car will make weight. <laughs> and I'm like, just like jumping up and down, going, this is super exciting. Like, you hear these stories of Everham talking about how he helped do this or that with Jeff, or how Petty did this, or Andrews did that, or McReynolds did this, and I'm learning all this watching TV, watching my dad, and he made me stay with that same guy after the race in Phoenix, and he went home, and that guy took me to this little factory called the Dwarf Car Company, and we picked up a new racing chassis. It was halfway built. It wasn't even a roller, and we got back home, and the guy's helping unload it, and my dad goes, here's your new car. If you build it, you can race it with me. I'm just like, what do you mean? I, I get to race? And that's how it all started, was my dad taught me everything from TV. I watched him race. I videotaped him. I helped work on the car and did so much with him. But it was just meant to be a hobby. It wasn't meant to be as big as it got here over the last two decades. And so it was, it was fun, just building the car with dad, I uh, raced it my first race. Uh, I was in Pahrump, Nevada, 1994. And um, they make you start last when you're a rookie. And I ended up finishing fifth. And my dad's, and I pulled into the tech line because I know just watching dad, like top five have to go to tech. And he won the race that night. And I'm there in tech already. And, he's, and he, he pulls up. He goes, what are you doing here? And I went, dad, I finished fifth. He goes, Shit, yeah, you're right. I didn't lap you. I didn't see you on the tow truck. And here you are. And I'm like, gee, thanks, Dad. Cool. Yeah, great support. So the second race, uh, we went to the Vegas Bull Ring, but they wouldn't let us run on the big track. We had to run in the infield. So it was the first time ever that dwarf cars were on the little uh, paved infield, and I won. Oh, that changed the game. I won in my second race ever. I beat my dad, the national champion from the year prior. And, man, my, my head got so big, I was like Kyle Busch after that. <laughs> it was game on. So third race, I wrecked. Fourth race, I wrecked. Fifth race, I wrecked. And we're thrashing all week. I'm going to school, trying to rebuild the car. We're welding, we're cutting, we're borrowing parts. And my dad tells me to go, um, go see the old wise man. The old wise man was Phil Hayes, who was a CNC guy that was helping us build our axles and some of the hubs. And Phil Hayes had won everything in Vegas back in the day. And the old wise man told me when I went there, well, he made me run the CNC machine for like two hours. I had to sweep the floor. I had to take out all the bins. And it was like this karate kid punishment. And I'm like, what? What is going on here? I'm just not getting this. And after we run the lathe and we get the axle finished up, he goes, this is your axle. You had to work for this because your dad says you're out of money. And I was like, 
holy smokes, like, money just doesn't grow on trees with, with this race and stuff. And he says, son, just stop putting yourself in position to wreck. And he hands me the axle, and I go out, and I'm like, what the hell did that mean? Don't put yourself in position to wreck. I'm like, it didn't dawn on me for, for a while. Uh, we get the car put back together, and this is where it all started to come together. This was a, halfway through that year, and however many races, I think we're in our seventh race. My dad says, I just need you to finish seventh tonight. I'm like, Dad, we're here to kick ass and win. I mean, this seventh thing seems boring. He goes, seventh place pays $35. It's 20 for your car's registration and 15 for your pit pass. We're going to break even tonight. I'm like, oh, all right. I drove as scared as I could ever drive. Just don't hit me. Just don't hit me. Just don't run into shit. Don't hit them. Don't. I finished eighth that night, and the pay window, uh, they handed me a check. It was 30 bucks. I'm like, man, I was told to, to get 35 so we can break even. So I gave the check to Dad. I go, hey, uh, we're five bucks short. You know, we didn't do that. He goes, yeah, five bucks short. Yeah, something like that. After all the wrecks, building the car and everything, that was a moment where he taught me the finance side of how to race and the awareness side. And you race your car in a different way when you understand that you're putting the time in it to build it and then what it takes to get there and the family commitment. And so that might have been May. Um, I didn't win again until August. It was around my birthday. It was my mom's birthday in July, and it clicked. Things slowed down. I could see the other competitors and make moves. And I was watching tapes, because now I had tape of my own self to watch. And you put in the time and, and, and all the things that it takes to, to, to develop it. And we went on a run. We won at 10 different tracks, 10 weekends in a row. I was rookie of the year and champion with the car. Uh, legend cars, Bruton Smith, Marcus Smith, everybody at SMI, 600 Racing, they were bringing legend cars out west. And we're like, man, this dwarf car stuff, we can't really travel with it all that because we kept, they kept throwing rules on us on engine size or weight. And that's when we switched over to legend cars. We won everything you could win with legend cars and won the West Coast Nationals, but couldn't afford to come back here to Charlotte. And I think Humpy Wheeler, uh, David Stetzer, Chris Powell, the whole gang around Las Vegas Motor Speedway said, we'll rent you a car from 600, go back there and race the Nationals. And so my mom and I would get a plane ticket. We put our four shocks in a bag. And I come to and go to work on this car at 600 Racing. It wasn't my car. And I'm like, wow. The time and the effort and the, the, the little details that went into the car that I was winning with, I stood up here and rented a car. And it was like, whoa, this isn't my car. And it wasn't my feel. But that was an opportunity. It was huge. Here I am as a 16, 17-year-old kid, and I'm going to the big show. I'm going to Charlotte, and I'm going to run this quarter mile. Um, I qualified 22nd. I ran over the restart cone, got black flagged. Didn't, go, didn't really turn out that good here, but it helped put my name on the map. The West Coast started talking, and my break came when um, the Trickle family, everybody knows Dick Trickle, uh, Chuck Trickle's his brother, and Chris Trickle was, was Chuck's son. He got um, killed in a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas while I was away at college in, down in Tucson. And I got a call from the Star Nursery racing team to come on up and you know, race the car. And I'm like, holy smokes, this is, this is my big break. Hold, yeah, this is, this is incredible. And I think I wrecked the first two races, of course, just being too nervous. Just over... Over sweating it, overthinking it, putting too much pressure on myself. Third race, finished third at Mesa Marin in the big race at the end of the year, uh, Bakersfield. Um, Harvick might have won that night, or uh, Inglebright was there. Hornaday probably was in the trucks by then. But it was like it was Bakersfield. And Las Vegas Motor Speedway was just coming up out of the ground back then. And the timing of how things work. And the next big break that I got is just, again, it's putting the work ethic in, 
it's putting the passion forward and continuing to drive and learn in all aspects of it. It's not just one thing, and I'm really proud of TR. TR was my PR guy for over six years, and it's this program teaches you so much to, to do more things just than other than just driving. And that's the compartmentalization of how to become a professional. And in 1999, we got on a run with that Southwest Tour car, running that late model. And we won six races, won the championship. But the big break came at, at Sonoma, ESPN. Dr. Punch, that, that was the first time ESPN covered a Southwest Tour race live. And I'm like, ooh, this is that moment. But it's like, whoa, hang on. Just chill. Just, just go drive the car and let things unfold. Trust the team. Follow the pitch strategy. Our pitch strategy was to pit at like lap 32 and run it to the end as far as we could on gas because that's what we watched on TV. Anytime you see road course races back in the 90s, people would pit and then just stay out as long as they could on a tank of gas. And I was able to win that day in Sonoma uh, with that Southwest Tour team. And my name started getting tossed around a little bit. Things started started happening. But here's, here's another key moment. That weekend, there was a, a NASCAR official that was part of the, the, the Winston Cup. He was also a volunteer for the Winston West and Southwest Tour Series. His name was Ray Judy. He was an official. And Ray's no longer with us, but Ray gave Jack Roush a tip. He said, you guys got to keep track of this kid on the West Coast. And Ray Judy came up to me at Tucson Raceway Park, September of 99, and said, hey, there's going to be a scout here watching you. I'm not going to tell you what team. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm not going to tell you to look around. Just do your thing. Do your thing. And the key thing is that there's always eyeballs on you, always, wherever you go, no matter what you're doing, whether it's a TV interview at track, whether it's a radio interview, whether it's just signing autographs and hanging out with fans, taking selfies and pictures, there's always somebody watching and at that Southwest Tour race, I ended up winning that night and completely forgot that there was a scout there. And we have the hauler there. We're signing autographs just like I was told Richard Petty did. He always stayed until everybody was gone. You sign autographs till the last fan leaves. And the last fan <laughs> that came up was uh, Matt Chambers, my crew chief, who ended up being my crew chief on that 99 truck. He watched every move. He watched every moment. Uh, and that's how I got invited to the Gong Show, where there was top five drivers from around the country. Northwest Tour, Southwest Tour, Goody's Dash, modified guy from the Northeast. Forgot his name. Uh, and then uh, one of the Sodders, Tim Sodder, actually, from, from the Midwest. And I was able to beat those guys at the Gong Show to get that ride in the truck series. And so I've always been a fan of Alan because he did it his way. I had no idea what the song on my way but my way ended up being very similar, and that's why I'm very thankful to just stand here tonight and tell you guys my story on how you go from one step to the next and get to that final level. But it was passion that got me there, and it's been professionalism the second half of my career. And so those are the, those are the two things that I want to teach you seven kids. There's, there's a lot that goes on out there. You don't have to be a professional right now. Still be a kid, but you gotta you gotta learn all the different parts of it. And I, I get emotional since my little wreck in Pocono, but it's part of some of the side effects. Uh, but again, it's fun to tell the story, and I, I've learned so much tonight. That this has been a, a magical night. So thank you, TR. Uh, kids, just keep pushing, and just know that there's 365 days in a year, and you got to race in your own head for 365 days. Because that's what it takes to get to the top. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.